All right. Well, it looks like there's a couple of people um, who are here already. Going to wait a, a couple minutes before we start just to see who else uh, comes in. All right, well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. <clears throat> so this uh, webinar today is on protecting assets from long-term care costs. And uh, let's see how we move to the next slide here. Okay, so um, some of the estate planning issues in 2018 are, uh, things have changed a little bit from uh, about 10 or 15 years ago, um, there, there's a high exemption of 5.6 million per person from estate taxes, um, which translates to 1.2 million per couple. So most people are not going to have an issue with the estate taxes upon their death. Um, so instead of planning uh, for those possible estate taxes, the people think, oh, I don't need estate planning if I don't have a, you know, money over the exemption. That's that's not true. You you still need um, to have a state planning, um, you need them now more than ever, really, um, and plan to protect your assets. Uh, the world has become increasingly litigious. Um, people getting sued for even when they didn't do anything wrong, um, just for trying to get settlements against them. Um, and uh, long-term care costs have risen exponentially. So, uh, so we recommend and this. Uh, the last two webinars that I did, first one is a revocable living trust that protects against probate costs, as well as other purposes. It keeps the things private, um, provides for if the beneficiaries have special needs or creditor issues, um, which ties into Medicaid. Um, you know, if somebody's on the government assistance and they get an inheritance, it can kick them off government, government assistance, same thing if they, if they have too many assets. So um, asset protection trust protects against future creditors, lawsuits, bankruptcies, et cetera. Protects against the homeless guy that throws himself on your Lexus when you're driving down. Uh, that, that happened to a friend of mine in uh, San Francisco. He's driving down the street and some guy like threw himself on his car wanting to get some money. Um, so, uh, but today we're talking about Medicaid asset protection, protection against long-term care costs. Medicaid, um, usually, and uh, what we're going to be talking about today is helps with nursing home costs. And then the veterans, veterans asset protection for those veterans who qualify um, can help uh, pay for long-term care costs with assisted living in home health care. Um, so there's four different ways to pay for nursing home or assisted living costs. I guess there's five. I just updated this. Um, Private pay, you can pay it for, for it yourself. Um, number two, you can buy long-term care insurance, which is being increasingly harder to purchase. Um, but one thing that you can do is you can buy life insurance policies with long-term care 
component, we can help you um, figure out how to do that. Um, you know, what would fit best for you with that. Um, and then Medicaid can help pay for a nursing home. It's a government program um, that's a, a federal program that's um, in a federal state partnership. Um, so each state um, distributes and, and manages that. And then Veterans Aid and Attendance Benefits, which is a federal program, not a state program. Um, so just some statistics here. <clears throat> For a 65-year-old American in 2018, the average number of years that they will need any type of services is three years. The percent of people who will need this is 69% of Americans uh, will need some kind of um, care service for an average number of three years. <clears throat> At home care, um, an average number of two years is needed, and that's 65% of people. Uh, nursing facilities, an average of one year, um, which at 35% of people, and then assisted living, one year, 13%. Um, costs are rising exponentially, and it's approaching $100,000 um, annually per person. Um, home health care services, this, these are numbers from 2016. We'll update with um, 2018 numbers um, when we uh, email this out. Um, homemaker services, 2016 costs, 3,813. Um, home health aid is a little bit more than that. Um, Adult day health care, you, you can read the numbers here, assisted living, uh, 3,600 a month, nursing home into the six and seven thousands. Um, so it's getting uh, ex exponentially larger. Uh, there's a 68% chance of a 65 year old becoming disabled in two activities of daily living at some point. And women on average will need care for longer than men, 3.7 years, and men will need care for 2.2. Uh, Twenty percent of today's 65-year-olds will need care for a period of over five years. Um, Hundred thousand dollars annually times 2.2 years for a male, 220,000 um, dollars, and this is for nursing home care. Uh, 3.7 years for a female, 370,000 uh, dollars, five plus years. Uh, if you're in a nursing home, you can easily see how that could um, deplete or uh, totally decimate somebody's estate. Um, costs have risen 11% since 2011. Um, some of the solutions you could, as I said before, you could purchase long-term care insurance. It's getting a lot more expensive now because they priced it wrong. Initially, they didn't realize how fast costs would rise uh, for long-term care. Um, and it's uh, becoming less and less available. You, although you can um, buy um, permanent life insurance products that do have um, a, a long-term care um, provision or rider on it. Uh, number two, you could win the lottery, um, 1.6 billion this week, right? But if you didn't buy your ticket in South Carolina, I don't, don't think you won. Um, send your child or grandchild to nursing school so they can come in and help take care of you, or you can figure out how to qualify for Medicaid and or veterans benefits. Um, Medicaid nursing care, um, some of this stuff, is, is a little technical and it's a little too detailed. I'm going to just brush over some of these things, um, but um, can uh, make this material available in an email, but today I won't necessarily um, talk through each point of each slide. This is from a presentation I did um, pretty recently for where I was um, teaching other attorneys how to do this stuff. So some of this is a little more technical than than it should be for those presentations, just letting you know. Um, so some people say, oh, I already have Medicaid. Um, but what they actually are talking about is they're a little confused. They have Medicare. Uh, Medicare is health insurance for um, people over the age of 65. Uh, Medicare Part A will cover the first 20 days of skilled nursing. Then it will uh, provide a copay of 157.50 per day for days uh, 21 through 100. And then the patient pays the full amount on day 100 uh, and 101. Um, so be prepared on day 101 to pay 100% privately or get approved for Medicaid, uh, Veterans Aid, and Attendance Benefits. Um, it's much better and cheaper to plan proactively than try to crisis plan. That's you know, planning after you need it. Um, failure to plan is, is a plan to fail or at least makes things much more difficult. Some of the reason for this is because you know, we can plan uh, assets um, in advance, but it has to be um, 
pretty well in advance for Medicaid. We need to, if we're going to be putting assets into a trust, we need to start planning five years before you need Medicaid uh, benefits. If, if it's for VA aid and attendance, the new rules that just uh, were implemented only a week ago um, now require three years planning ahead. It used to be um, one day planning ahead for veterans, but now they, they just changed the rules on that, uh, unfortunately. Um, so Medicaid, based on federal law, states administer the law, as we said, um, and uh, it's the, the most widely discussed program is nursing home Medicaid, but there's other programs that have uh, um, different gifting penalty rules. Um, Basic eligibility, you have to be a U.S. citizen, 65 or older, um, meet the definition of disabled, um, if determined so by SSA. Um, financial, you have to meet income and countable asset limits set by each state. Income uh, could be capped at $21.99, that's from 2015. Um, assets for a single person, $2,000 is generally the maximum, so um, you can see that uh, you know, it's pretty hard to qualify for Medicaid if you want to have any kind of money to supplement any of the care that you're getting. Um, and a community spouse, uh, which means a spouse that's not going into nursing home or um, assisted living, they generally get to keep. Um, now the number was just raised to uh, 123,600, uh, which still today's world is not a lot. Um, and this Miller Trust is a, a way to get around those income requirements. We're not really going to get into uh, details of this today, but it's a way that income over that amount that's uh, allowed um, can be it's kind of legal money laundering that the government allows us to do uh, to put tr excess income into this trust. And we won't talk about the details right now. Um, the minimum monthly maintenance needs allowance. This is the amount that the, the well healthy spouse is entitled to. Um, and uh, it's you know around two to three thousand a month that they're able to keep um, to to uh, provide for their own needs while their spouse is in, in a care facility. Um, so this this slide this is just a, this is a little more important. Um, these are countable assets. Um, everything counts uh, for your asset. Um, some some are excluded, um, but. And we'll get into the exceptions here in a minute. Um, checking accounts, investment accounts, CDs, cash, real property. Um, home is usually um, is excluded. Um, boats, RVs, um, IRAs. Some states don't count the IRA, um, but some do. Um, every state's different. Um, these are excluded assets here. The home um, states which which have adopted this this law, um, federal law have either a $543,000 or $814,000 limit on equity with exceptions for a spouse, minor, or disabled children. Um, you have to have the intent to return home. Um, an automobile can be excluded. Uh, most states allow any value, so that can be a good planning opportunity. Um, household goods, personal effects are excluded. Um, prepaid burial and our service for Medicaid applicant spouse or other immediate family member. Other income producing property, which provides income for the family, retirement income, um, life insurance policies with a face value of $1,500 or less, um, community spouse resource allowance. Um, we're not we're not going to get to all the weeds on this, but um, there's there's different ways to that uh, to determine the snapshot date of when that spouse is is given the the picture of how much they're going to be able to keep. Um, some of that is uh, strategic uh, timing and, um, and uh, legal strategy that we, we know how to do. Um, gifting rules. Uh, so this is where we talk about some of the um, rules with, with putting assets into a trust. Um, a gift is a transfer of assets for less than fair market value. A uh, gift made during the look back period, which is for Medicaid is five years. They look at everything you've done the past five years once you need uh, nursing home care. Um, it results in a penalty period. Um, and for VA, it's three years. Um, starts with the date of the Medicaid application. Uh, the period of time um, Medicaid can look backwards um, is, is 60 months for, for every state except for California, which is 30 months. So it's one thing California's doing right, it seems. Um, proactive planning. Um, 
you want to perform gifting to get the look back period started um, earlier. Um, calculating the penalty period, and this is some more um, detailed stuff that I don't really want to get into right now, but to just tell you if, if you need Medicaid planning and you, you have, let's say, $45,000 in countable assets, um, and then you say, well, I want to get qualified for Medicaid, but you haven't planned ahead. Um, then Utah uses a penalty divisor of $4,526, where they say, okay, for each month um, or, or for each, each uh, transfer um, amount of $4,500 or more, you get a month penalty. So if you gave $45,000, um, once you needed um, nursing home care or Medicaid coverage, you're going to get a 10 month penalty where you have to pay for yourself uh, for nursing home care for 10 months before Medicaid's going to start paying for it because you gifted away $45,000 and it's a 45.26 per month penalty. Um, so this, this is another reason to plan ahead. Um, it's, it's much more difficult to plan, although it's possible that there's some other different uh, rules and techniques that may or may not get into today. It's, 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 uh, it's better to plan ahead with this sort of thing. Um, exempt transfers, uh, if you transfer your home to a spouse or to a child under 21 or a child who is blind or permanent, permanently disabled, it's an exempt transfer. Uh, you can transfer it to a sibling who has an equity interest and live there for one period year prior to institutionalization. Or to a child who resided in the home and provided care to you for the immediate prior two years. That's, a, that's the caregiver child exception. Uh, and another exempt transfer is you can purchase a life estate in someone else's home uh, if you reside in the home for a period of one year after the purchase. Um, all other assets may be transferred to the spouse or a third party for the sole benefit of the spouse or from the spouse to a third party for the sole benefit of the spouse. Will we still be counted as part of the um, community spouse resource allowance. Um, you can also transfer assets to a disabled child or to a trust established solely for the benefit of a disabled child or to a trust solely for the benefit of a disabled person under age 65. Um, annuities are another way to plan, um, but the state needs to be named as first beneficiary. Um, they only get up to the amount that they paid out on behalf of you. Um, the annuities have to be irrevocable and not assignable, actuarially sound, Equal payments with no balloon payment. Um, not, you know, it's not considered an asset if it's purchased with proceeds from a retirement account or an annuity within an IRA. Um, you can also do what's called a private annuity where you, where you um, can issue a promissory note. Um, <clears throat> so there's a few trusts that are exempt. Um, we're not going to talk about the details of these right now. Um, gifts plus a partial return. This is another planning strategy where um, I'm not going to get into the details of this right now. It's kind of complicated, but it involves uh, giving gifts to a child who then uses that money to give back to you to pay for your care. It can reduce the penalty period in half. Um, caregiver agreements. Um, this is a way to also spend down assets and protect excess assets by paying a lump sum to a caregiver with no penalty. Um, advanced planning, um, suitable spend down expense without a penalty. So you can also use it to pay a family member. Um, lump sum agreements are prohibited in some states, must be fair market value. Um, and then we talked about this earlier, allowable spend downs, prepaid burial, funeral, cemetery plot, home improvements, prepaid utility, uh, vehicle, goods and services that directly benefit the Medicaid applicant. Um, so this is the part we want to talk about a little bit more, proactive planning. Um, this is where you can, you can um, put assets into an asset protection trust specifically designed to be qualified for Medicaid, um, irre irrevocable income-only trusts, where the grantor spouse is only allowed income, never access to principal. So this takes it the asset uh, from being countable for you to not being countable anymore, but you have to perform this. Um, in a window of time before you need assets. You want to do it before the look back um, period can look back to you. So you want to do this type of planning at least five years ahead of when you think you're going to need um, Medicaid um, assistance. 
assets transferred to this trust will incur a penalty period if it's within the look back period of, of the five years for Medicaid, three years for veterans. Um, primary tax related goals, and we're not going to talk about the details of this. This is, this is more technical stuff. Um, but just so you, just so you know, um, it allows your children to receive a step up in basis of your trust assets. Let me just talk about this for just a second. Um, I had a conversation with some women on a bus. Um, they were talking about how one of them, one of their friends um, had to go to a nursing home and their house was exempted uh, from being countable for Medicaid. But that doesn't mean it's protected against the state coming at, after that asset. Because what happens is if you go to a nursing home uh, here in the state of Utah, the state's going to, uh, if you have a house and that's basically your only asset, the state's going to qualify you for Medicaid. But then after you die, they're going to come to um, whoever the owner of the house is after your death, your heirs or your, your spouse, they're going to say, look, we paid out $150,000 for care for your spouse. And now we want that money back from this house, from this asset. And they're going to put a lien on the house or, you know, take, take the asset if they can. Um, they're going to want to get paid that money. Um, so this lady was talking on the bus about how her friend, had um, lost their their house was lost after they their friend died because the state had paid so much on their on their care and I and I asked them uh, kind of what their plan was and the lady said I'm just going to give my house to my kids and you know not only does that is that going to incur a penalty if it's within the five year look back period but it's going to cause capital gains issues for their kids because if they if you bought a house for, let's say, you know, a long time ago, $50,000, now it's worth $500,000. If your kids get that when you die, um, they get a step up in basis. So if they sell it for fair market value the day after you die for $500,000, they're not going to owe any capital gains taxes. But if you give the house to them before you die, they're going to have to pay taxes, capital gains taxes on $450,000 in um, capital gains because they're going to get the step or they're going to get the initial basis that you paid for it if you give it to them as a gift. So I told the lady not to do that uh, because it's going to cause tax problems for her heirs. There's, there's a much better way and a much cheaper way of, of doing this type of planning with this type of trust. Um, income and, and capital gains, if you put assets into this trust or tax at your individual tax rates. And for most people, when they get older, that's, that's going to be um, hopefully um, a lower tax rate um, once they get up into those ages. Um, preserve real property tax exemptions. Um, so if you have real property tax exemptions, these, this trust will preserve that. Um, and it will also preserve the capital gains exclusion in case the home is sold as far as the Internal Revenue Code Section 121, which allows if you've lived in the house for two of the past five years, if you're a single person, you get a capital gains exclusion of $250,000 of capital gains. If you're married, you get an exclusion of $500,000. So that's a powerful exclusion that you want to pr uh, protect as well. Um, you can fund these trusts with life insurance. You can put life insurance into them. Um, so permanent life insurance, cash value life insurance, checking accounts, CDs, stock security accounts, money markets accounts. You can basically put anything into this type of trust that you want to preserve and protect from being counted against you for Medicaid. Um, and uh, this is a little more technical slide about um, it's called a grantor trust, which means it's, it's taxed to you. You don't have to do an, a new tax return for this trust. Um, it's, it doesn't. It makes it easier to use than, than some other trusts are sometimes. Um, step up a basis, we just talked about that. Um, and this is how the trust achieves that. I'm not going to talk about the details of this right now either. Um, and this, we just talked about this as well, that uh, the Section 121 exclusion, not going not to get into details of this trust. So what if the community spouse dies first? So what if, what if uh, you need Medicaid? Um, to help pay for a nursing home and your spouse is the well spouse quote unquote the well spouse and they have this um you know they have their resource allowance well, what if they die first um and they have these assets well it's important to have a, a testamentary um you know don't get confused by that that's a that's a technical term supplemental needs trust set up for the medicaid spouse um 
prevents the spouse on Medicaid from losing eligibility was what happens is if your spouse dies and she, and she has, or he has uh, $123,000 of assets. And then you you inherit that 123,000 or inherit part of that, all of a sudden it's going to disqualify you from Medicaid. And that's not what you wanted to do initially. Um, that's going to cause some problems. Um, so, so it's important to do in your estate planning, um, do it the right way so that there's supplemental needs trust set up um, if your spouse dies. And uh, so it's for, there's something that's a legal term called the elective share, which so some states would allow the elective share to go into the supplemental needs trust. Others don't. If no planning is done, Medicaid will enforce the Medicaid spouse elective share and the benefits will be lost. And that's something we don't want to have happen. Um, and another issue, durable powers of attorney. This is a financial power of attorney. This is where, uh, this is part of the planning we do where somebody can step into your shoes financially and, and um, control your financial affairs. Um, if you become incapacitated, this is an issue with this type of planning because someone can become incapacitated and if they, have a financial power of attorney that was drafted incorrectly. And this slide says that 99% of the existing ones are um, because they used to be drafted with it. Um, if it's drafted incorrectly, they won't be able to do the right type of planning for you. They're going to have to go get a conservatorship or guardianship, which is going to take time, which is going to mean lost um, benefits and it's going to mean more expense. Um, the problem is um, that I mentioned that a lot of these durable powers of attorney have federal gift tax limitations on the power of attorney. They were worried about uh, incurring gift tax liability if they gifted more than $15,000 in a year. There's no longer a federal gift tax except for the lifetime exemption coupon, which we talked about in the very first slide, is now, what, $5.6 million per person. You can gift $5.6 million per person in one year and not have a gift tax um, expense. But most of these um, formerly drafted powers of attorney have a limitation of $15,000. And you can understand if somebody's incapacitated and they need to do planning, they need to put, let's say, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars into a trust so that they can, um, or, or uh, other types of, of gifting um, to qualify for Medicaid. Um, you can see where there's some problems with this if they're incapacitated. And like I said, it's going to cost more time and more expense. Uh, so you need to make sure that we, we get these drafted correctly. Um, so now we're going to go on to veterans benefits in attendance. Um, and the rules just changed a week ago. We're going to update some of the info on this slide um, to reflect those rules. But basically there used to be a zero days um, look back period. Now there's a three year look back period. Um, and now the, the community spouse or the or the applicant gets to gets to keep uh, one hundred twenty three thousand dollars in assets. Um, it used to be about forty to eighty thousand. You never really knew how the veterans uh, administration was going to um, go. It depended on how old somebody was, and that's dependent on how how much time they had to live, is how much access they would let them keep. Uh, they had you know actuary actuary tables said that they had longer to live. They let them keep a little bit more if they had less time to live and they let them keep less. So it's kind of a roll of the dice before. Um, so these are just some of the rules. We can't charge a veteran a fee for assistance with filing a VA claim. Uh, we charge a fee for planning, but uh, we, um, we help um, filing a claim uh, without charging a fee um, until the claim's decided. After this denial, we can charge a reasonable fee for applying for benefits. Um, there's two types of disability benefits. One is service-connected compensation. The other one is the pension. This is what we're talking about for uh, long-term care um, for this aid and attendance program. It's um, a disability benefit for wartime veterans. Uh, there's no service connection. You don't have to be injured in service, um, and it's means tested, um, which uh, means that there are assets and, and uh, income um, tests. So, um, and this, this slide will be updated as well. These, these numbers just changed a week ago. Um, but a veteran with uh, no dependents for in attendance uh, can receive up to $21,000 per year. 
a veteran with a spouse or a child can receive um, about 4,000 more per year. Um, and a surviving spouse receives less um, if they need aid and attendance, if their spouse was the one who was the veteran. Um, there's a three-part qualification process. Um, the first part of that is service requirements. Um, it has to be a veteran, a person who served in active military, um, who was discharged honorably, um, or you know anything other than dishonorable discharge. Active duty, wartime service, 90 days of continuous active duty, and it has to be service of at least one day during a declared war period. They didn't have to be in combat. They didn't have to be in country. Um, periods of war, just uh, for reference, World War II was from 41 to 46. Korea from 1950 to 1955. Um, there's not too many World War II veterans still alive. Um, Vietnam, 64 to 65 or 75, and Gulf War from 1992 is still uh, officially ongoing. Um, it's, the under, it's an undetermined end. Um, second part of the qualification process is a disability requirement. You have to be 65 or older or permanently disabled. And um, two, two aspects of the means tests are income and net worth. Um, we're not going to get into some of the details of this. It was a little technical. It's beyond the scope of this webinar today. But uh, just so you know, um, part of the issue with qualifying for veterans is if you have too much income, you're not going to qualify. Um, and uh, so that's some of the reason why we do some planning with with some of the income. Um, you, you can't really do the same kind of type of money laundering that you can do for Medicaid. Um, so. The incomes of veterans and spouses, gross income minus unreimbursed medical expenses. Um, so for the surviving spouse, you have to be married. You have to have been married at, at their death. And they, you have to have been married at least a year. And you have to have not uh, been remarried to somebody else after they, the veteran died. Um, there's some exceptions to that. Um, and so the aid and attendance allowance, the presumptions are you have to be blind or nearly so, or patient in a nursing home, um, inability to dress or bathe, incontinence, uh, need protection from hazards, incident to daily environment, bedridden, um, allowable unre unreimbursed medical expenses. And so this um, benefit pays, helps pay for in-home care, uh, Medicaid, uh, some waiver programs do it. This, this is uh, easier to help pay for in-home care. Um, wages paid to the caregiver are proper. Um, it does not have to be a licensed health provider. It could be a family member. It cannot be the spouse, though, um, because wages to spouse are counted as income. Um, this can also apply for independent living, um, but only when the facility provides custodial care, which is bathing, showering, dressing, eating, getting in or out of bed, or a chair or toileting. Um, can also count room and board as unreimbursed medical expenses if, the phys if a physician states in writing that a claimant must reside in that facility to receive custodial care from a third party. Um, so this is something where the physician uh, becomes an uh, important team member and allowing for this um, to be um, achieved. Um, and custodial care is not meal prep or medication management, which are a couple of the two big ones that most people um, start to need uh, telephone assistance, transportation, housework or laundry, or 24-hour emergency assistance. So, and this this number has changed. We just talked about it, it used to be between 40 to 80 thousand. Now it's 123 thousand six hundred dollars. Um, but there is a three-year look-back period, um, and uh, the, the changes were were coming. Um, for a while, three year look back, it was rumored um, there was going to be an asset limit. Annuities uh, were not going to be exempt. Um, so, what we would need to do to, to prepare for the future is um, a veteran's asset protection trust, which is, which is different than Medicaid, um, to shield assets. Um, these are comparisons of VA pension, Medicaid. Um, VA pension, uh, you know, there is now a three-year penalty or look-back period. Uh, the Medicaid penalty period, uh, it's the same now for VA pension, except it's a different look-back period, determined by the amount of gifts made during the look-back period. And uh, the Medicaid reimbursements um, 
single person is allowed to keep uh, $90 of the pension if on Medicaid. Um, married, non-Medicaid spouse can qualify for VA pension. Um, and you get the living allowance with Medicaid. Um, so some of these, these numbers have changed, and we'll, we'll update these numbers as well. Um, so, but assets for Medicaid, you're only allowed $2,000. Um, it's different for VA pension. Um, so, um, the advantage for a VA pension will help with any type of medical care, in home health care, assisted living, um, and uh, with Medicaid, the financial help can be much greater. Um, because most nursing homes, uh, I don't know any nursing homes anywhere that you can pay for the amount of nursing home care with the amount of the uh, VA pension because it's um, much smaller than what's usually needed. Um, so this is just a slide for ethical considerations because some people say, well, if I have assets, I should have to pay for my own care. I should make the government pay for that, and that's fine. Somebody, um Things that way, but I would, what I would suggest to somebody who's um, worried about that um, is to, you know, leave your house out of the asset protection trust to allow for estate recovery. As I talked about earlier, that lady's friend lost their equity in their house because of how much they had to pay. Um, but if you do that, you're still going to get a 50% discount on average over private pay because. The amount that uh, these care facilities charge Medicaid is um, is usually about 50% less than what they would charge a private person. Um, so I would, and I would advise to still place a house into at least a domestic asset protection trust for asset protection purposes. Um, and as we discussed the last time, Utah, not Nevada, has the best asset protection laws in the nation. Zero days statute of limitations for future creditors. And that's the end of the show. There are the uh, end of the uh, presentation. Um, are there any questions from anybody? Um, like I said, we're going to be uh, updating some of the info on some of these slides, and we'll be sending it out um, in an email, and um, so that, that you can have it on hand and um, kind of refer to it if you have any questions. You can also also call us. Uh, you can email me, Brett at BregliaLawOffice.com, BregliaLaw.com, uh, um, and you can uh, ask me any question you want. We can talk about how this could work with your current estate plan, um, and uh, if there's no questions, uh, we'll go ahead and end the seminar. Thanks for joining us.